Welcome. We're going to uh, to get started. Um, delighted to see people here, and I know uh, Jenna has to multitask this uh, atop uh, another commitment. Um, so we'll we'll bear with that. Um, uh, so today's uh, discussion is focused on uh, programming with categories uh, lecture three uh, from the MIT IEP course by that name, and uh, I think we'll. We'll start as we typically do uh, with um, questions, comments, um, uh, you know, points of discussion with that material. Uh, and uh, I've, I do have a, a, quite a few slides here related to the material that we may or may not get to um, and that might intersect or not with some of those questions. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen and we will uh, go over here to um, uh, to the slides. So, can you folks see my slides? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's uh, that's great. So, uh, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, I think, before hitching up my. Uh, my tablet. Uh, we'll we'll just start with the slides themselves, and if we have to go to the tablet, I may have to pause the recording while a screen video adjustment goes on. Um, so uh, for those who watched that video a bit of time ago, or who would like a bit of reminders on some of the major elements covered within the programming categories uh, session three, I've tried to uh, enumerate them. The major ones here. Um, so uh, the discussion in that class uh, kicked off uh, with Bartosz Milewski uh, uh, continuing a thread of discussion that had been started by uh, Brendan Fong in the previous lecture, in lecture two, um, commenting on the fact that uh, while lambda calculus is a Turing universal um, uh, means of expressing computations, of, of characterizing computations, meaning that you know, any, any computation that we can capture on a Turing machine or a general purpose computer um, can in principle be captured with, with Lambda calculus. Um, it is an untyped uh, system. And it's, it's a system that operates um, without uh, regard for or bookkeeping involving types. And there was some discussion there about motivations uh, for types. Uh, that we could expand on if there were interest. Um, uh, the lecture then continued on to discuss some Haskell basics, um, uh, some of which had to do with kind of mere syntax. Um, uh, things like the use of double colon to indicate that uh, a given quantity is of a, a given type, whereas a single colon is, is uh, reserved for a list uh, catenation, concatenation. Um, uh, and uh, ways in which you, you can bind names, uh, declare functions, uh, uh, conventions involved with capitalization of, of types or type parameters, um, uh, denoting uh, infix versus prefix versions of, uh, of a given uh, function, uh, pattern matching, and, uh, and the use of currying to go back and forth between taking a pair on the one hand versus taking the first element of the pair and returning a function that then takes the second element of the pair and does its, does its work. Um, so here, uh, currying is, is used uh, in a way that will uh, presage some, some, um, some looks we'll, we'll uh, be examining it through the lens of adjunctions later. Um, uh, and it was noted that categories support typed reasoning in contrast to lambda calculus, which is untyped in its most basic form. Um, uh, categories by virtue of the fact that we um, a given uh, pair of arrows can only be composed if, if we consider them, uh, these arrows uh, in a category kind of representing types and functions, which is normally what we operate with when we're modeling a, a, a language, a programming language, um, 
And those are two functions. Two functions can only can be composed if the output of the first is the same as the input of the second. Um, and uh, that's what allows composition to occur within such a category where we have types as the objects and functions as the morphisms, as these maps or arrows between, um, between those types. So it supports a kind of typed relationship, uh, typed because we can't combine any two old functions like we can in untyped lambda calculus. Um, now, uh, there's a discussion a uh, little bit about, you know, Haskell being approximated by a, a category or a, you know, some people call it a, a pseudo category or quasi category. It's, it's um, uh, not a full category because of the risk of, um, of non-termination that's always present. Um, and the fact that because of risk of non-termination and, and the fact that errors can occur, a lot of things that we think of as functions normally, uh, and therefore arrows, um, are actually partial functions. Um, so maybe you have a, you know, you you have a function which gets the index, a certain specified index, into a list, and you give it a negative value. You take a square root of a negative quantity for a, a square root routine that only returns reals. Um, it's outside the domain of that function and it throws an error. So it's a partial function rather than a total function, rather than a function that takes in, you know, it completes and, and returns for any value that it's given. Um, and uh, I had noted that uh, Haskell is often characterized by this category Hask, which is types as objects and, and functions as morphisms. And I have a kind of little picture of that here. So here we have types and um, between those types are arrows or morphisms, which here are functions. So one between int and bool might be is even. One between float and bool might be is negative. One between float and int might be ceiling, for example, which would take a floating point value and convert it into an int. And um, I think you get the idea. These are, in this case, functions, um, whereas these are types, you know, on um, you have a set of all possible values of, of bool, type bool, or a set of all possible values of type int. Um, so um, it was mentioned briefly, and it's kind of a pointer to, to a, a later class that's coming up in the not distant future. We might get to it next week. Um, that that the morphisms here, these these functions, like is even or is negative, um, ceiling, uh, those actually have a type as well. Um, so conceptually, there's an object associated with uh, morphisms between these types. Um, ceiling has an object associated with it that's float to int, um, the maps, a, a map, a function from float to int, is even as a type associated with it, that's int mapped to bool. Um, and uh, there was a mention that, that reflects the fact that Hask, uh, this pseudo category is, um, is a Cartesian closed category. Um, uh, it, it has an object associated with every morphism. Um, and as we'll see soon enough, that's what's called an exponential object. An exponential object like A to the B represents functions B mapping to A. Um, and in fact, it's very value indicates kind of the, the number of such functions are. If you think of B as the number of of uh, possible values in B and A is the number of possible values in A. Um, uh, A to the B gives the number of possible functions from B to A. Um, so we'll be seeing that as an example of a universal construction um, in, uh, in another couple lectures. Um, uh, there is some discussion of polymorphic functions that we can readily 
create functions in Haskell, which um, which don't accept just some pre-specified type, but which which are type parameterized, so they can they can be used with with uh, arguments of many different types. Uh, so uh, you know we might might, for example, have a function that takes in an, a list of whatever type and, and returns a, a length of that list, um, or that uh, takes in a, a, a list of numbers and, and, uh, and counts the, the number of them that are, uh, that are non-zero or what have you. Um, so uh, polymorphic functions uh, are functions that can operate with type parameters, meaning they can operate on different types. Um, they're not limited to, to one set of types um, for their definition. Uh, we also um, saw some discussion of composition of functions, not surprisingly because it's core to the notion of a category. Uh, composition of morphisms is core there, and composition of functions is an example of a composition of morphisms for the category of types and functions. And we have an identity function, which if we compose it with any other, gives that other, other function. Um, so an identity function might be from int to int, for example. Um, it maps a given integer back to itself. Um, and we could call it as, we could call it once and then do is even, and we'll get the same results as if we just did is even um, by itself. Uh, and we can call this at any function as many times as we want, and it won't change um, what, we, what we get. We'll always get back the same results. So this composition of function and identity functions that reflect composition of morphism and identity morphisms. Um, and then the lecture took a different turn with a discussion of, of this construct called a functor. And a functor is a different sort of beast. It's a, it, to think about functors requires us to, to leave the world of, of simply one category and to think about mappings between multiple categories from a category C to a category D. And it consists of a, of a mapping from objects in C to objects in D uh, and from morphisms in C, like F to morphisms in D, but in a way that's very well behaved. Um, if we have two objects in C um, and we have a morphism between them, the morphism in the, uh, in the target category here, D, has to go between where F is, uh, where A is mapped to and where B is mapped to. It has to go between it. So if we have A and B and a morphism F between them, we, we get F of A being where A is mapped to, F of B being where B is mapped to, and F of F, lowercase f here, um, is the mapping of, of that morphism which goes between F of A and F of B. But there's more than that. It has to preserve structure, and structure is determined here by composition. And so something that's uh, identity morphism over here in, in C, that you can do it as many times as you want, and then uh, compose it with any other morphism, you'll get that other morphism back. Um, that identity morphism has got to be mapped into an identity, a corresponding identity morphism in D on the same object. So if A is mapped to F of A, uh, an identity morphism on A, um, say something that takes in an int and returns an int, has got to be mapped to whatever F of A has, has become. So maybe it maps ints to bowls and, um, and we will uh, then turn a, an identity map on ints to an identity map on, on bool, something along those lines. Um, but more than that, we also have to preserve composition. So if we have a, a morphism over here in C, that's the 
composition of two morphisms here, F and H composed to this, this bigger morphism from A to C. F goes from A to B, and it's composed with another morphism H from B to C. Then when we compose them together, H after F, we get something going from A to C directly that is the result of this composition. Okay, um, and when we map F over and we map H over and we compose those two, what those got to give is the map over of H composed with F over in C. So in short, whether we do the composition over in C and then map it, or whether we map F and then H and then compose over in D, we get the same exact morphism. So it's it's this this functor is honoring the structure, as it say. It honors the structure associated with identity morphisms by turning them into identity morphisms, and it honors the structure associated with composition by by mapping that composition over in a beautiful fashion that preserves that composition. So you can do it on either side um, of the uh, of the mapping. So these are functors. Um, they're structure preserving mappings between categories, not willy nilly mappings, but mappings that preserve that structure. Um, and um, the note was made there that, and, and, it's, and it bears, well, it bears a little bit of emphasis that when we're dealing with although a lot of our intuitions come from this category with sets and functions between them of which hask is a is a close relative um uh we we here often are oblivious to a need to preserve additional structure that comes up in other contexts because sets really have almost no structure. They, uh, they're, they're different elements in them that are distinct from one another, but there's no mappings between those elements within a set that, that when we have a function that maps it to another set, say something that takes in a, a, you know, a set of um, apple, banana, and pair, and asks, you know, which of them are, uh, you know, and maps it to colors. Um, th there's really no structure within that set of apple, banana, and pear. There's nothing that, you know, is is an order relating them. For example, is a banana bigger than pear in that set itself? Um, uh, if if we want to impose that, we can, but we're going outside a set that we're, we're imposing a pre-order, for example. Um, but uh, sets itself has kind of minimal structure. And this is a theme we're going to come back to again and again, because um, the fact that it's minimal structure means that we sometimes have to stretch our imagination when we think about preserving structure. Um, it also means that it, it leads to this profusion of functions and set um, that is unusual. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, massive numbers of functions we can get in set. If we map, you know, uh, B to A, we have A to the, to the B um, uh, power of a uh, number of, of functions. Um, so, we saw last time that functors also map shapes. And there's this notion, you know, that we we talked about last time of kind of finding this shape. These uh, different colors denote different functors here, you may recall from our last uh, coverage. And here we're finding this shape, the walking arrow here um, in this so-called index category on the left. We're finding it over here in another category D. We're finding different instances of it. Here's one instance uh, between these two things. Here's another instance here, or yet another instance here. And so we can think of functors as, um, as finding a, an instance of a pattern in another category. As it turns out, we can also think of it as kind of embedding a version of one category or an, uh, in another. 
Um, and there's other intuitions to which we'll come back there. Um, and then it was alluded to briefly by Bartosh, I think in his closing minutes, that um, if we start thinking about functors and we, we start thinking about, um, we have these categories um, and we have these mappings between categories, um, it's a very uh, category theoretic um, impulse to ask, you know, is there a category of categories where the objects are these categories? You can almost see them as a big blob here. It's a big dot. Um, and, uh, and the morphisms are functors. Uh, and the answer is yes, and it's the category cat, although there's some technical needs to say it's a category of small categories. So uh, categories that are um, that have a finite number of, 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 of categories, or sorry, of objects within them. Um, and, and so we'll be popping up to this next level where we we go meta, we, we, we go up to the next level of abstraction where we are often deal with some construct and then pop up another level where we don't look inside the categories and we just envision mappings between them, for example. Um, and in fact, there'll be a category higher than that, which is where the objects are functors and the mappings between them are natural transformations. And uh, we can continue to, to go up like that. So these were some of the topics talked about in this uh, lecture. Does anyone want to advance some questions about them or, or some points for discussion? Some things that confused you or that, um, that interested you or that you'd like to put out there for some further explication. Okay, not, not hearing any uh, comments. Maybe I'll throw a few things out there and see if these might stir things up. So, you know, there were some utterances made about motivations for types, but I, I, I thought it, to really do it a little bit more justice, I should mention, you know, sort of a more language theoretic or, or software engineering perspective on it. You know, when, when it comes to motivations for type, Bartosz, you know, spoke about um, heading off errors. And, and that's a really valuable motivation for the use of types. Um, who knows the number of, the, you know, of, of JavaScript programs that have crashed because there's a, you know, a use of a string where it should have been a number, for example, um, and it wasn't discovered until runtime by a, an error that occurred. Um, uh, very common, but there's a lot of motivations uh, for types that go beyond that. Um, you know, uh, I think early on, particularly types um, came into were recognized as, as very, very valuable in allowing us to efficiently map quantities within a program into hardware resources. Um, so in Fortran mapping, you know, floating point numbers differently than integers, for example. Um, so if you're programming for a Cray computer in the you know, late 70s, um, you wanna be very clear about what gets put on what resources. Mm. Um, uh, another motivation is kind of code transparency and you know, some parties have uh, over the years created even naming conventions that connote the type associated with the quantity. That's what uh, 
one of the major variants of uh, Hungarian notation was at Microsoft, um, was you actually encode the type and the name so that when someone's dealing with it, they know what sort of thing it is. Um, just by looking at the code, th there it helps make the code more comprehensible if you see, oh, this quantity is a uh, potentially null pointer, this quantity is a uh, is an integer that's uh, used as an index. This quantity is, uh, you know, is a is a double precision value, so that when you're looking at the code, it, it kind of helps you make sense of the operations that you're seeing. Um, another one is, you know, a certain amount of typing is is put in place as conveniences to 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 enable software development, whether it's complex numbers or you know, natural numbers or uh, quantities associated with uh, pairs or what have you, having the, the right building blocks is a real asset. And um, there are certain abstractions that are very natural to support easier software development. And we're going to come back to this issue in just a few lectures as well when it comes to algebraic data types, these data types that can be combined together using certain operations. Um, uh, so we could take products of them or co-products, uh, take either's of them or take you know tuples of them, um, take mappings between them, et cetera, and we could kind of build up these, these data structures. And later we'll see recursive types uh, associated with that. And um, these are kind of natural building blocks. Um, some of them are natural building blocks for certain domains. Some of them are building blocks when it comes to kind of flexibly combining other base types into higher level types. Um, uh, another thing is types allow you to optimize. This is a bit different from just efficient mapping, but they allow you to recognize invariants that can allow you to optimize out certain inefficient cases. Um, so the fact that this, this quantity is guaranteed to be, you know, great, never less than zero uh, might allow you to avoid certain types of checks when you're using it to index into uh, an array, for example. Um, uh, the fact that this value is is a uh, double precision uh, quantity allows you to uh, to potentially optimize some um, some bit of a floating point code to avoid shifting and reshifting back or what have you. Um, uh, and then, you know, some programming languages uh, have long, uh, programming environments have long benefited from the ability to suggest filling in of certain code with certain options. So as a convenience to the code creator, it sort of proffers, you know, things that you might uh, put in place here to handle the different possibilities or what have you. Um, so, um, uh, so, so this is some comments and types. Any questions or comments on that before I go on to some, um, some comments on uh, Hask and on functors? Trying to see if there's anything in the chat. Oh, Rust gives some interesting motivations for types and things like uh, compile time check concurrency. Yeah, so you can use threads without uh, worrying about resource management. Exactly, exactly. So types capture structure. Um, they they impose extra structure beyond what we have in in uh, lambda, uh, untyped lambda calculus. That structure is captured in categories uh, explicitly within the rules for composition in a very elegant sort of way. But it's a general reflection of the fact that, you know, imposing structure um, can often free uh, the programmer from certain types of worries and uh, 
and allow for widespread optimization. Um, this this point about um, you know your flexibility is restricted, but in some areas you're freed from certain burdens is a really strong advantage. And some some newer languages are really exploiting that. And I think Alex's example with Rust is a uh, is a great example of of this capturing these sort of invariants. Um, okay, so I, I alluded to Hask. Um, here, objects are types. Um, morphisms are functions between types. Um, and composition of morphisms is just function composition, right? And identity morphisms are identity functions. Um, uh, I'm not showing it here, but function composition is, thank goodness, associative. Associative. Uh, so, if you compose F with G composed with H, it's the same as F composed with G, and then H. Um, and and so it's uh, associative. Um, it 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 has this nice associative property. Um, and uh, we have this uh, this nice property with, you know, the. Uh, the features uh, involving uh, identity functions that if we compose it with other things, we'll, we'll get that other thing back. Um, so if we compose a float to a float um, and then do as negative, we get the same thing. Uh, sorry, float to float, excuse me. Ooh, float to float, that's identity. There's many float to floats that, you know, like take negative that are not identity. But a float to float that's identity just takes in a float and returns the same value. There's floats to floats like take negative, take the square root. You know those aren't those aren't uh, identity. There's lots of self morphisms that are not identity morphisms, but there's a distinguished identity morphism um, maps float to itself. That if you do it and then you do as negative, you always get the same thing as if you had just done as negative, or you could have done as negative and then done bool to bool as the identity. I would give the same thing too. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're doing the left or the right, um, but you need a different one if you have is negative going from float to, to bool. You can do it float to float before is negative because is negative takes a float as an input, or you can do it, you can do is negative and then a bool to bool after because it's is negative takes a bool output um, or it gives a bool output. So they're quite, quite different. Okay, so you know the the pseudo category or quasi category Haskell. Um, abstractions are often approximations. There's a wonderful quote by Einstein, something to the effect that you know, to the degree that the equations are precise, they don't describe the world. To the degree the world uh, things describe the world, they're not precise, or something like that. I'm I'm butchering it, but. Um, you know, abstractions are often approximations, but they, they may be good enough. Uh, the image out of Poston and Tilly's realist evaluation is, you know, constructing a pontoon bridge to cross a swamp. Uh, we do this in modeling all the time. We get a model, it's, it's good enough. It's never a perfect reflection of the world, but it's, it's good enough to allow us to pragmatically um, do the job. And, and you know, the, the, the category of Hask is, is really a, a very good approximation and it really helps our thinking to, to consider it. It's not foundationally you know, broken in a way it's completely useless for any reasoning. There's a lot of reasoning it can support. There's certain reasoning that you, you, know, you, you need to think beyond it. You need to supplement it. Um, so um, you know, here we, we have objects that are sets and morphisms or uh, sets of a certain type and morphisms that are functions between them. And I've talked about the, uh, the composition, the fact that it's this Cartesian closed category. Um, so here, anything going between type A and type B, in other words, it's a morphism in the HOM set from A to B and Hask. Um, might as well get used to that notation. So maybe it's something from int to bool, like is even, and there's another one is odd, and there's another one is prime, and, and so on. Um, uh, the fact that all of those are themselves characterized by a type, 
namely into bool as Marx said as a, as a closed category. Um, and, uh, you know, because of non-termination and, and the risk that, you know, you get errors, things are, are partial functions rather than total functions. Um, and there's ways that people try to deal with it, you know, talk about always having a, some notion of, of, of uh, termination imposed by providing a certain amount of gas, a certain amount of petrol that, that allows you to go a certain distance to keep things total and, and comments that Bartosz made there. Okay, so we talked about functors. I, I'd like to, um, uh, well, any questions about the quasi category of Hask and, or the, the pseudo category of Hask? Any, any questions about this? Because it's, it's, it's one that to which we'll keep on returning. Questions? I'll look in the chat here. Well, I guess, uh, can you kind of quickly summarize the ways in which it's not a true category? Sure. That being um, possible? Yeah. So the way in which it's not a true category, one of the most sort of Probably the, the clearest way. I kind of think of them as two ways, but it, you know, in, in the lecture and some of the subsequent discussion at MIT, um, really is kind of it was kind of collapsed into one way. But I kind of think of it as two ways. I mean, one way is a, a, something that we think of as a function between int and bool may not terminate. So from a computational standpoint, from the standpoint of a Haskell programmer, it's a function from int to bool, but it may not terminate. Um, it may go on forever. It may diverge, um, it may not complete. And we wouldn't really call that, a, a, I mean, it's not a total function because it never returns a bool. And sometimes we refer to that as returning, you know, we sort of, give the notion it returns bottom. Um, it, it actually doesn't return a member of bool. It returns, a, it, it's like it non-terminates. And so we, we treat it as kind of a special value like bottom. It, it, it gives a distinguished value that's, that's non-termination. That, that's what that function has. But it doesn't always give a bool. So it's not, from a mathematical standpoint, it's not a real function from int to bool. Um, so it's a partial function, perhaps. Maybe, maybe for some ints it converges, but for some, I don't know, negative ones or ones that aren't even or whatever, it 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 doesn't terminate. So that's one reason. Um, there's another reason, which you know I think of as kind of, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a software engineer, and so I like th that's a bit different for me phenomenologically from something where I call it and it crashes for certain of its, you know, int inputs. It terminates, but in an unwholesome way, right? Um, uh, it, it does not return a bool though still. In both cases, they don't return bulls. The first one never returns anything. It just goes on forever. Um, this, this other one, it crashes, it, it dies. Um, and, uh, and that it's also a partial function. We give it an int, and for some ints, it it doesn't give us back a bool. So we term both of those partial functions. So they're partial because there's certain inputs for which it will not return a bool. And we'll see later. We can model those actually in category theory quite readily. Um, but uh, we model it like bool plus one, where one is like some distinguished other value, a single value that's distinguished, um, like, like crash or something like that, exception. Um, so when it comes to computational effects and monads, you would actually characterize it like that. But um, those are two reasons why this is not truly a function in Haskell, always a function. Um, it will be a function if it's total for every int we get out a bool. Is that helpful, Wade? Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Great, great question. Other comments, questions? 
Okay. Um, so I will, um, I will just uh, make some some further uh, remarks said about functors. Okay, so um, functors maybe seem initially like they're pretty accessible. Okay, we have a mapping from objects to objects. Well, I mean, they are accessible, but there, there's a bit of subtlety there. Or, or there's some cherished misconceptions that often come up, um, things it's easy to fall into, mistakes and in, in, in assumptions that you're making that we can head off by by discussing them. Um, they're, they're common mistakes. So it's a mapping of objects to objects, and it's a mapping of morphisms between those objects to a morphism between the corresponding objects over in, in the other category, right? So we uh, A and B, we map A over, we map B over, and the thing between them, F here, is mapped over between those mapping of A and the mapping of B. Nice, okay. But it has to preserve some condition, certain conditions. So it, it, it honors the identity morphisms, right? Maps them to identity morphisms here. Not just any self morphism. No, 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 it's an identity morphism. Something that if you compose with this, with any other thing, you get that other thing. That has to turn into something you compose with this. With any other thing, you get that other thing. Um, this has to go from genuine identity to identity not just any self-morphism. And it has to preserve composition of morphisms, I should say, of morphisms. Um, so we saw, you know, this is a composition of F and H here. This got this long body here. And uh, we can either compose here and map over, or we can uh, map F, map H over with the morphism, with the, with the functor, and then compose them, and we get the same thing. It's it's guaranteed to be the same thing. It has to honor those by by preserving them. So composition kind of means something in D that's kind of has a structural relationship to what it means in C. It's not just you know scrambling things around in some sort of ungainly way, um, or I should say unseemly way. Um, uh, and and then the laws like associativity, uh, unitality are, are actually preserved. Um, and and really, it's it's easy to get a caught up in mapping of of arrows. You might think of arrows, or sorry, mapping of of objects. You, you might be excused for thinking that's more basic because that's how defines how the morphisms go. But actually, it's the the fact that morphisms are mapped in a certain way that's frequently the main point of interest. Um, and we talk about the functor, and this is important. We talk about the functor lifting uh, this morphism into a morphism over here in, in D, okay? Um, so this functor lifts F to operate in the D domain. That's the term that's often associated with it in computer science and, for example, in the LISP community going way back. Um, and in the functional programming community, we lift F to operate on D, okay? Um, and there's a certain visual presentation that can come with that. Um, and you could kind of think of this as kind of embedding C and D. All these things, mark my words, it's an important point. Everything in C has to be mapped to something in D, you know, something compatible, um, something that, is consistent in the way that it's ruled out by functors, that they're structure preserving. Everything in C gets mapped to D. Not everything in D has to be hit. That doesn't mean like it has to go to everything in D, not at all. And in fact, some things in C can be collapsed into things in D. Um, they can be just shrunk, you know, to a, to a like two more, two objects might be mapped onto the same object. And the morphisms between them might be mapped to you know, self morphisms there, um, potentially, you know, potentially identity or other other self morphisms. Um, so you could think of this as kind of D as kind of an abstraction of C. Sometimes it may collapse certain distinctions that are in C, but but not in D. You could think of it as an interpretation of C and D. 
or you can think of C as being kind of embedded in D. Those are kind of useful intuitions. Um, yeah. Um, so that's that's functors. I'm, maybe I'll I'll make a few other points here, and we'll we'll open it up uh, for discussion. Um, um, now this is an important misunderstanding to head off. Um, what this is functor is telling us is that A maps to F of A. It's not telling us. It's important. It's not telling us how each little element of A inside A, you know, uh, somehow was mapped to. How does that map over to each element inside F of A? No, no, no. You're not looking inside A. You're not looking inside A or F of A. It's just a dot. You're saying A here maps to F of A here. Um, it, it's just it 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 the functor selects F of A here for it. You're not asking like it's a function of the elements. No, it's just saying A goes to F of A, um, B goes to F of B. Um, you're not defining some sort of function in the elements. There might not be elements. There, there, there might be very different things uh, in there, but we're not getting into those. Functors don't, don't deal with, with those. Okay. Um, now, uh, I should say that you may be wondering, like, could A be mapped to multiple things in D? And the answer is no. It's a function of from objects in C to objects in D. So uh, a function could take two objects from C and, and give the same value in D, but it can't take one of these and turn into two things in D. The, the closest thing that does that is called a profunctor. And profunctors can actually be used more generally for relations between C and D. And they're really cool. They can, you could think of them as kind of instituting a relation between C and D, where an object here might go to multiple things. Uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, profunctors are really neat. Uh, and they've got lots of other beautiful properties. But, but here with a functor, no, no, no. You, you're not dealing with that. Um, uh, and for each morphism in C, so for every object, you have to map it to something. For every morphism between objects, you have to map it to a compatible morphism between the corresponding uh, uh, the corresponding mappings of those objects of its start and of its finish. Um, so every morphism here has to be mapped over. It can't just neglect some. It can't just say, what the heck, they're going to go to the black holes. No, no, no. They got to be mapped over, even if they're just mapped to identity morphism. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, right. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, we'll come back to this issue of contravariant versus covariant later. Um, okay, um, I've kind of made a lot of these points. Um, it, it may well be that it maps multiple things onto the same thing. It doesn't have to be injective. It may map you know, these things over where many objects of D and many morphisms in D are not mapped to. There's no mapping to them from C. That's fine. It's not surjective. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be surjective. It doesn't have to be injective. It doesn't have to map A and B to different things. Um, in fact, there's many cases where that's not uh, the case. Um, uh, yeah, and sometimes you map a non-identity morphism in C into an identity morphism in, in D, for example, and and that's okay. Um, uh, okay, um, so I, I've made some utterances there. Any comments or questions you'd like to add to that? Or, you know, things you'd like to, to put forward for discussion? I'll look in the, the chat in case someone's using that. Boom. One yet. Sometimes silence is golden, but this one is um, 
questions are like gold. Diamonds. Okay, maybe I'll make another utterance. Um, category theory is all about relationships. But it's about relationships where the relations preserve structure. And as I said earlier, sets don't really have much structure. And we're very comfortable talking about functions between sets, but there's not a lot of structure being preserved there between those sets because there's not a lot of structure in the sets. Here, functors are kind of first glimpse of this kind of philosophy. When we have mappings, we want them to preserve structure. So the structure of a category is defined, not in its objects, but in how the mappings, there, the morphisms relate to one another. It's defined in the sense that you have an identity morphism, which when it's composed with any other, it gives that other one. And that's a bit of structure. There's this relationship um, there between you know, the identity and, and how it composes with other things. Or you have, one morphism um, that composes with another to get a third one. And, and this composition, H after F, uh, arises in some structured way by composing H after F. That, that's, remember that when it comes to defining a category, this is really important. We pick what the morphisms are and we pick what composition is. I wanted to have a slide on this. You, you may remember, um, that with some categories, we talked briefly about, um, about monoids, for example. And it was basically the same category um, when we had a monoid for star and we had a monoid for plus. The only difference is we had a different rule for composition with a monoid for plus. If we, if we had one the morphism for one compare, uh, composed with the morphism for two, we would get the morphism for three. That's for plus. But if we had times, if we composed one with two, we would get two. The only difference was we had a different rule for composition. So we choose the rule for composition. We choose sort of what that rule is. And it often implies what the identity morphisms are. Like, are they zero or is it one? Um, is it the one morphism that serves this identity or the zero morphism? It'll be different. That's where the structure is in a category. So, so we want to preserve, when we have this mapping, when we have a functor preserves structure, that's the sort of structure we're talking about here, preserving the structure of composition. And that's exactly what's going on. So H after F, we can do it over here at C, or we can map over and do it over here in D. And that same principle, that same sort of notion of honoring structure when we're mapping is going to follow us all through our category theory. And we're going to see it again with natural transformations, where what we're mapping between is functors, and the mapping between them is a natural transformation. It's a structure preserving mapping between them. And we get this naturality property, which basically means we can do it in one functor and then convert over to the other functor, or we can do it, we can convert over first and then do it in the other functor. Um, it's the same basic theme of mappings are the heart of the issue here functors are the heart of the issue and they they're they preserve the structure of the things that they're mapping and when we're dealing with sets there's not really much to preserve and so it's we don't have great intuition for it if you can understand functors it may seem like a small step but it's an important step if you can understand wrap your head mind around that you'll go a long way to understanding this notion of when we say we want maps to preserve the structure of something, what is it we mean? And that will take you very far
into you know higher levels of, of category where we have functors as object and natural transformations between them and, and upwards from there. Um, it's that notion of preserving structure that's at the heart of category theory. And it's the notion of, of recognizing that structure, honoring it and speaking explicitly about it. That's what we're doing here uh, with, with uh, category theory. And that's what thinking about functors will allow you to do. So um, this is you know, about finding structure in a category with functors. Functors are all about structure. Okay, um, so I could, I could comment more, but I think we are uh, out of, of time unless anyone has any final questions or comments or discussion they'd like to put forward. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you to review uh, the in fact that oh man should have should have shown it here. Um, ask you to review. Oh gosh, I don't I don't have it uh, in here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to review lecture four. It's not this link, but it's lecture four. Uh, which is going to be led by David Spivak, um, where he's going to go on to discuss uh, functors in additional detail. But before you do that, um, I'd like you to work through some exercises. So I posted some exercises to the to the Canvas site, and I'd like you to to uh, work with them. Um, there's some commentary on top of them, um, and try to go through them. Uh, one of them is actually one he talks about in in lecture, but the others should make you think. And they have to do with with this finding patterns, um, and it has to do with thinking about functors and how they, what what freedom do they have in mapping? Given they have to have to map all objects and all morphisms in these ways that are that preserve structure. So. I gave those exercises if you want to undertake them. I tried to do it in a way you could submit the results this time. I, I frobbed some additional settings and hoping that works. Um, so see if you could submit it on the Moodle site. If you can't, just email it to me and let me know. And I'll probably consult with one of you about how to set it up to, to uh, allow you to submit it. Um, but uh, one step at a time. So anyway. That's, uh, that's it for today, and I will see you in two days to have further discussion of functors and uh, taking them further and discussing a little bit about how they um, are manifested in Haskell and how Haskell we lift functions, just like we lift a morphism here into another category. Here we can lift functions being lifted to operate between the mappings of the types. So if we have an A to B, and A is mapped to maybe of A, and B is mapped as a type to maybe of B, this function from A to B is lifted to be a function from maybe of A to maybe of B. That is a functor in Haskell. Uh, we are mapping it over, but it's from Hask to Hask. Uh, and that may be slightly confusing initially. It's an endo functor. It's a functor that goes from C to C, okay? Um, uh, and, and that's what we'll be looking at next time. Um, uh, there's even a song about it in the US, from C to shining C. Uh, but they weren't always thinking about functors when they, when they put that together. Okay, um, so that's all for today. Uh, and I will look forward to seeing you Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.